You're listening to Super Hits on Radio Deco. Swing along, sing along, stay tuned and don't go anywhere. Thank you everybody for uh, having me in your homes today. Um, I hope the stress of COVID will soon diminish for you uh, and the rest of the world. Um, I'm going to talk about radios and uh if you uh, you can see a few behind me in my study world is becoming just a segment in the digital media landscape part of the many ways in which information and entertainment is received and accessed but in its time it was a major player in people's daily lives and actually the first piece of technology that brought communication into the home and with content for everyone so this is a story about the advent of radio and perhaps how its trajectory was changed by Art Deco and by famous industrial designers. I think it's quite interesting, and I hope you might enjoy a look at a glorious moment in the story of radio that actually has not been well documented and barely remembered. Now, I'm sure you know this, but Sydney is about 6,000 miles from Mumbai. And did you know that Australia is two and a half times the size of India? But... Your population is 500 times that of ours, 1.3 billion versus 25 million. And actually 90% of all the people in Australia live on the fertile East Coast and about 20% of all the people in Australia live in Sydney. Sydney is known for its beaches and its casual lifestyle. I'm sure you're aware that India and Australia have a commonality and that both were part of the British Empire. And that does impact a little on our story about radios in the 30s, 40s and 50s. You became independent in 47, whereas we are actually still part of the Commonwealth. And rather than becoming independent, we still have ridiculous ties to the British establishment. It's only in recent years that Australia has come to grips with the fact that in 1770, the country was taken from the indigenous Aboriginals who'd lived here uninterrupted for some 50,000 years. The British claim that nobody lived in Australia when they arrived has been proved false and slowly the history of Australia is being rewritten to reflect the less than glorious reality of British colonial times. Now, I'm very impressed that you have achieved World Heritage status for the Art Deco buildings in your city and part of that is the importance of books like these focusing on local Art Deco architecture of great cities and actually when I counted them, there were about 13 books about Art Deco in uh, great cities of the world. And actually that stimulated me to produce one for uh, our city in Sydney, which didn't have one. And in 2019, I published Sydney Art Deco, um, which is pleasing to say, uh, sold out and being reprinted uh, at the moment. Um, in the same way as you have an area which is special in Mumbai, we actually have a little area called Potts Point and Elizabeth Bay, which is a small precinct of less than 0.4 square miles, less than one mile from the city centre, which actually has over 70 Art Deco buildings and 30 modernist buildings and actually no modern high rise. And that is absolutely unique in Australia. Um, and of course, I live in that area and... In the same way as the story of radio design became clear to me as I built my collection, as I got to know the Art Deco buildings here in my neighbourhood, there was a revelation that this area is something special in Australia and even world class. So I'm just finishing this walking booklet and you can see in the map the density of Art Deco and modernist buildings. And if you went on a little cruise uh, in the, on the water, um, you would be able to see its beautiful setting and these arrows here show you the volume of deco buildings. So encouraged by your success in Mumbai and that of Miami South Beach and Napier in New Zealand, I'm hoping this booklet and Sydney Art Deco uh, will help to make this area safe from development and its architectural and cultural significance appreciated locally and worldwide. Let's move on. My profession is dentistry. My passion is photography. Uh, my obsession is collecting, mainly Art Deco. And most of my collection is 20th century Art Deco inspired. Art, glass, sculpture, furniture, clocks, jewellery, ceramics, 
as well as globes from earlier centuries. But it is the 300 plus radios, which might give you the notion that I'm completely out of control, way past being an expert connoisseur and heading for the demeaning status of a compulsive hoarder. But I'm actually saved by my wife, Jan, who's a wonderful woman who not only partners and encourages me, but is the talented curator of our possessions. She said at the outset some 20 years ago, she said to me, buy only the best. They should be perfect and beautiful. And I happily complied. Um, but I was actually all in after the first word. Once she said buy, I was very happy. Um, she ensures the radios are tastefully displayed. They're not on every surface. Uh, as would probably happen if I was in charge. In fact, my first two radios were one American and one Australian. I bought them in the 1990s in England on a whim. I knew absolutely nothing about radios. I, I was surprised that they were actually plastic because they looked much more grand than that. And what I realized fairly quickly, what, what, what is a truism is that radio collectors focus on local works from their own country. And that's easy because they're accessible and it's patriotic. So Australians collect Australian radios, Americans collect American radios, and as a consequence, the perspective narrows and the story becomes somewhat self-indulgent and even distorted. And of course, there's an understandable focus on repairs, restoration, stations, programs, and radio celebrities. I admit I know nothing about wiring diagrams uh, and valves or tubes as they call them in America. And it's amazing to me that these are still available uh, and easily accessed. And in fact, the back of the radio is a complete mystery to me. And I leave that to a group of guys for which this is radio heaven. In the USA, as you see here in this picture, 110 volts doesn't require a transformer as with the 240 volts used in Australia, India, UK and Europe. And consequently, the American radios can be made much smaller and are much lighter. In fact, making the radio work is the cheapest part of restoring a radio. A broken plastic cabinet is actually difficult to repair well and brings the value down significantly. And if you are looking at plastic radios, the best way to assess repairs is from the inside of the cabinet held up to the light. So I was part of an odd little group that liked plastic cabinets. And so for a few years, I followed, followed the normal pathway, concentrated on Australian radios, particularly the Bakelite ones. And this built the collection that underpinned my first book, Radio Days, uh, which I brought out in 2008, and uh, which is still selling after 13 years and has sort of become a Bible for Australian collectors. But I must admit that eBay was dangerously addictive and I kept buying the occasional uh, European, uh, English and American radios and researching their origins. It occurred to me that radios actually didn't develop in parallel evolution. They didn't emerge unique and complete in each country and with each new model being the result of local influences. But like architecture, art, fashion and design, there would be moments of inspiration and innovation somewhere in the world, followed by recognition, diffusion and adaption in other countries. Books on radios tend also to be country centric, but my research and my radios were telling me there was a bigger global story. And while I accept that the story of radio is fundamentally about the transmission of radio waves and the content that comes out of the speaker, I don't think that's the whole picture of radio and its evolution. It's a bit like saying that a car is only a measure of its engine and its wheels. And so to the story of cab radio cabinet design, the shape, the materials and the colors, they have multiple inputs from many people and manufacturers in a number of countries, which not only have implications for the story of radio, but actually add something significant to the history of industrial design and the world of Art Deco. And remember that these sort of cars, the beautiful cars of the 30s and 40s, were expensive and made for the rich and only a few were ever made. But these radios, on the other hand, were beautifully designed, but they were cheap and produced for the masses. And so what I want to explore today is a striking relationship between important industrial designers in the early days of their profession the Art Deco movement, which was spreading globally in the 1930s, and a small subset of radios in the 30s and 40s, 
which introduced mass-produced streamlined design and affordable radios into the home. It might be overstating it, but this appears to be one of the first times that art met industry, changing the way objects were perceived, produced and marketed. Now we need to be aware that the time frame is important. Three huge worldwide upheavals bookend and punctuate the time frame of our story. There is the legacy of World War I, the disaster of the Great Depression, and then the social and political upheaval in the build up to World War II. All that surrounds the story of these radios. Radio actually had the fastest uptake of any 20th century technology, including the telephone, the TV and the internet. If you start in the mid twenties, by 1940 in the USA, 90% of homes had at least one radio, whereas the car and the telephone were not at this level until the 1950s. At that time, 75% of people got their news from the radio and particularly so in rural areas and for those with literacy problems. And most people believed what they heard on the radio. 12 million households in the USA had a radio in 1930, rising to almost 30 million by 1940. Exactly like the Art Deco movement, the development and uptake of radio began late in the 20s and reached a peak by the 50s. The focal points in the early 30s were England, Germany, America and Australia. But by 1940s, radios was a worldwide phenomenon and like Deco, it developed its own local style in each different country. Radio continued to flourish after World War II, but by the 60s, transistor radios came in, styling faded, as did Art Deco. Now, India was actually an early adopter of radio. Broadcasting began in 1923 during the British Raj with programs by the Bombay Presidency Radio Club and other radio clubs, the private uh, Indian Broadcasting Company uh, had two stations in 20, 1927, one in Bombay, one in Calcutta. But at that time, there were only 3,000 licensed radio owners. The daily broadcasts of two to three hours consisted mainly of music and talks. And early on, the number of radio sets all over India was very low and it remained a rich man's toy. In 1930, the government took over the broadcasting facilities and began the Indian State Broadcasting Service, which became the All India Radio uh, in 1936, by which time there were perhaps 100,000 radios. Uh, the All India Radio broadcasted whitewashed news from the BBC um, and later focused on the news of the World War II, while somewhat neglecting Indian news. The numerous underground radio stations were considered dangerous and most were shut down by police forces. When India attained independence in uh, 1947, there were six radio stations within Indian territory, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Tiruchirappalli and Lucknow. The All India uh, is the All India Radio is the largest network actually in the world. In, in 1956, it was changed to Akashvani, but it is the largest radio network in the world. Uh, and one of the largest broadcasting organization in terms of languages broadcast and the spectrum of social, uh, economic and cultural diversity. Uh, it comprises 420 stations located across the country, reaching nearly 92% of the area of the country and 99% of the total population with 23 languages, uh, and 179 dialects. Private participation wasn't allowed until 1993. And I understand there's been a resurgence of radio after 2000, and it's still a growing section of the communication media. So, okay, what's special about the radios we're gonna talk about? And I'll start by making some assertions and then we'll explore them. Um, 1930 was a time of global issues. There were many things happening. Uh, there was the residue of uh, World War II, uh, the depths of the depression and political change in Europe particularly. On the positive side, there was uh, radio becoming a significant new communication technology moving from a novelty to a necessity. 
Maine's electricity is spreading into the home worldwide, and this reinforces the uptake of radio. We are seeing a new design style. The machine age and speed are influencing the early expressions of streamlining and modern styles. And new materials such as plastics go hand in hand with mass production. And the assembly line contributes to make the affordable radio a global phenomenon. Consumerism took off uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and this was the idea that you could not, you, you were, that you aspired to buy things that you couldn't afford and were encouraged to find ways to justify the purchase. Advertising became a major feature in newspapers, magazines, and then in radio. And actually the radio gave birth to the commercial. The expansion of radio stations uh, made private commercial enterprise run against state run media in many countries and entertainment on the private radio stations were underpinned by advertising and targeted marketing broadened customers for the radio. So we'll talk about that. We'll focus on this tabletop or mantle radio, midget radio, some people called it. It was a distinct entity and that was a huge influence on the way radio was perceived, marketed and used. This influence brought the full variety of information and entertainment in an affordable package to all members of the family. And with women as consumers, radio had an aesthetic appeal, one of the first pieces of deco in the home, not just as a piece of furniture for the lounge, but as an appliance with different purposes, different shapes and colors for every room in the house. And that deco styled uh, radio was a symbol of machine age modernity and perhaps the promise of a brighter future. Small radios were targeted for other rooms in the house. And they gave all members of the family a chance to independently choose their programs. By 1940, the mantle radio was outselling the larger console two to one, and it changed the listener from the family to the individual. And it's important to make the point that while advertising for radios often used women, in the case of the small, cheap tabletop radio, it was also targeting women as consumers, not only for themselves, but through them, other members of the household became potential purchasers, such as children and the elderly. If the only radio in the house was the expensive wooden console in the lounge, radio may have remained a male dominated family experience. Note that only I, the master of the house, have the wisdom to choose the program for the family and the skill to find the station and adjust the volume. We were lucky that the tabletop radio allowed an expansion from that position. So, okay, let's see how this all happened. In 1924, the crystal set was a novelty. You needed earphones. There were a limited range of stations and very poor reception. In 1926, the addition of tubes or valves and a battery to power the receiver improved the reception, but you still needed earphones. In 1927, the addition of a loudspeaker made listening available for more people. And by 1928, the availability of mains electricity eliminated the need for a battery and access to home AC electricity slowly expanded during the 20s and more quickly during the 30s. And the stage was set for the next evolution. Just to show you, these are examples of commercial English crystal sets rather than homemade ones. And this is one of the first single tube radios from Germany. And note that it had a Bakelite case. Now, in 1928, radio is becoming more popular, uh, but it is stuck in the world of furniture and wood. And note the price of the top one, that is the, the console up the top, without tubes or speaker is $325 in the US. And even the box at the bottom with the speaker is $194. So these are not cheap items. Now, it's pretty clear that certain things follow a linear trajectory. There's a clear evolutionary line from the horse and cart to the car, even though there were extraordinary changes in the source of power and the materials used. And even today we talk about a car's horsepower. The gramophone 
was a new technology in a recognizable piece of furniture that actually evolved into the wooden radio console radio but clearly retained the essence of a standing piece of lounge furniture right through to the record player of the 1950s. So the radio box with a separate speaker predated the integrated wooden console. And in 1927, we see the first hint of a real change. This extraordinary speaker by Philips in 1927, designed by Louis Kauf in Holland, is not only the first speaker out of Bakelite, but the first true expression of deco styling in the radio world. These were extraordinarily popular in Europe and the UK and millions were sold up till 1932. It still sat on a wooden or metal box, which was almost invariably Victorian or Edwardian in style. The only other comparable piece of art deco styling in the radio world at this time was this tiny five inch tall mini Lux bedroom speaker designed for the upmarket French ladies' bedroom. These were made from celluloid, which was an organic plastic, both flammable and fragile. So as you can imagine, very few of these remain in existence, but mimicking mother of pearl, they display a full range of Art Deco finishes on the surface of the speaker. So our real story begins in Germany in 1929. Without any fanfare, the Nora radio company in Germany made a complete mantle or tabletop radio. That is the speaker, receiver all in one and connected to an electrical outlet. In less than one year, the idea had spread to the UK, the USA and Australia. And in all likelihood, the tabletop radio for the next 10 years or more would have looked like these, either Victorian and Gothic or maybe a touch of deco. And it did, Men millions of these radios were made, but something else happened. Back to Germany and the Nora company. The next year in 1930, the Nora company went a step further. They created the first molded Bakelite radio cabinet, the Sonnenblum or Sunflower. Here is not only a new form, but in a new material and a new style. And this is for me, the first completely modern radio. As an aside, the Nora company was owned by a Jewish family called Ahrens and the name Nora being their name spelt backwards. In 1933, they were the fourth largest radio producer in Germany. Within one year, the company was Aryanized, producing Nazi radios and the Ahrens lost their business. But we're back in 1930 and now we have two ideas, the tabletop radio and the Bakelite case and no predecessor to constrain or dictate the evolution of this form. Again, this idea spread like wildfire across the world. And now we had the potential for millions of brown Bakelite radios competing with the bland brown wood tabletops. But something else happens to offset this. It's the depths of the depression. It's the early 1930s. Nobody can afford anything, but everybody wants a radio, particularly if it could be small, portable and affordable. So a few smaller radio companies in the US and one larger company in the UK explore the new potential market, which incorporates new design styles, the potential for mass production with the new plastics and maybe colors and getting more radios out there with a new batch of consumers and even more radios in each house or work workplace. And so they approach some designers. Now, a few of the designers were established furniture designers associated with manufacturers already making wooden radios. And for them, radio was invested in furniture and their palette was limited to wood. Many of these early successful companies like Atwater Kent in the States did not stray from their wood radios and by 1940 were left behind. But the ones that interest us are the industrial designers. In the early 30s, it was an absolutely new field. All of them had come from uh, other professions, such as graphic design, theatre sets, fashion illustration and architecture. They had little or no work during the Depression, but radios were actually still selling regardless of the tough times. And though these commissions to design radios were not as prestigious as designing trains, boats and buildings and other important pieces that these designers are famous for, in the early and mid-30s, designers had to take work when it was offered. 
They used a wide range of materials, but mainly the plastics, and their coherent link was the shedding of fussiness in favour of streamlined design. Thus, with the plastics, the radio case could be a simple box with some flourishes or something much more adventurous. Mass producing the new moulded non-flammable plastics as the shell that surrounded the chassis tubes and speaker allowed both for size reduction and great freedom in styling. So even though we're talking about a small subset of radios, this is not a minor phenomenon. I have found hundreds of beautiful deco radios in 15 country, countries and identified an amazing 37 designers. Now, most of these are in the USA and UK and with a representative each from Germany, Italy and Holland. But their influence was global, reinforcing the spread of the deco style in radio all around the world. And when you look at this list, it is surprising how many of the world's most illustrious industrial designers and the founders of streamlining contributed to radio design and they were both innovators and an impetus for the spread of the streamlined style in radio. It's not only their contribution is significant, but the timing is important. This is a dense slide, but the clear commonality in red is that the radios were designed early in their careers, mostly during or just after the depression and at the dawn of the industrial design profession. The only long-standing arrangements were John Vassos, who spent 20 years with RCA, and Wells Coates, uh, the architect, who spent 10 years with Echo in the UK. In almost every case, the designs for which these designers are well known came after they designed their radio, and we'll see that in a minute. So, if we look at Harold Van Doren and Raymond Lowy, who started the ball rolling in 1933, Van Doren was the president of the Society of Industrial Design. Raymond Lowy was the father of streamlining, the man who shaped America, the father of industrial design. Norman Bill Geddes was the man who designed America. John uh, Walter Dorwin Teague was the dean of industrial design. And John Vassos was called the quintessential modernist. Now, all of these men are more famous for other creations everything from a matchstick to a city. And there are many more, Alexis Sarknovsky, even Charles and Ray Eames got in on the act later, Clarence Karstadt uh, with his rocket radio, uh, and there are many others. In England, Wells Coates, the architect, Serge Chemayev was an architect, as was Jesse Collins. They all worked for the Echo Company, uh, which has some uh, association with India, which we'll see in a little while. Um, and in Europe, you had Livio Castiglione in Italy, Louis Kalf uh, in the Netherlands, and Walter Maria Kirsting in Germany. So let's have a look at this. For instance, Lowy's cold spot refrigerator and the Pennsylvania Railroad came after West, the Westinghouse Columnaire of 1931 and the Colonial Radios of 1933. And have a look at the price of the Westinghouse. Uh, when we look at the prices of tabletop radios later, we're talking about $193 for a, a basically a console radio. If we look at Dorwin Teague, yes, he designed the Kodak Baby Brownie in 34, but in 35 and 36, he designed the Spartan Nocturne, Bluebird and the Sled. And thereafter were the Texaco gas station, Steinway piano, a lamp, and the Polaroid camera all came afterwards. Harold Van Doren, his Air King radio was the first thing he designed. He also designed the Skippy Racer scooter, the Toledo scale, and the Maytag Master Washer of 1939. Isama Noguchi is actually well known for his table of 1946, but the radio nurse that he designed in 1937 is a, a full decade before that. The Castiglione brothers in Italy were just out of university when they designed the Fanola radio. And this beautiful radio was some 20 years before they designed the Arco lamp, which most people know the Castiglione brothers for. The impact on both small and large radio companies in the USA was substantial. 
And although many of the other companies may not have had name designers, the results were different, yet all aspiring to match that benchmark set by the industrial designers. And as you can see here, all these beautiful radios uh, came around in the, between about 30, three, uh, 34 and 39, um, and all reflected the quality of design that these industrial designers had set the benchmark for. And if you looked internationally, you can see from Spain, Denmark, Belgium, Mexico, Australia, and France, they all followed that line. And, and, and if they didn't have designers, um, they, they utilized the essence of the design that they were seeing from these uh, the similarities and the timing and the styling makes the connections very causal. I mean, give you an example in Australia, uh, the influence is not only immediate, but a rather blatant and unsubtle plagiarism. Astor stole Lowy's design for the Colonial 300 within about three months of the time that that radio was released. The Colonial 300 was released early in 33. By late 33, uh, Asta in Australia had produced the, the, this um, radio, the Mickey, and the speaker that went with it called the Mini. So they not only stole uh, uh, Lowy's design for the, low, for, the, for the grill, but they also stole uh, RCA's uh, or Disney's uh, names of Mickey and Minnie. And they went even further than that. Um, they started using um, the name Mickey Mouse and they brought out in 1949 uh, the Mickey Mouse radio for what is approximately $26 and stole Disney's imagery. There was actually a court case and um, uh, Disney didn't win at all. Um, uh, the Astor Company was allowed to continue using the word Mickey but not the image. Uh, and they did so very successfully. If you have a look at the top right hand of the dial, you will see that some very clever uh, person who designed this used, an, uh, in Australia, the radio stations reflected two letters um, of the name of the city or wherever it was. And these two, Dubbo and Cessnock, were D-U and C-K, and some wag uh, decided to put the two together, uh, spelling duck. Um, the Mickey radios that Astor produced subsequently um, went for 10 years from 39 to 49, and with a world record 22 different colors in that particular series. Now, much of the success of the small radio had to do with the use of resins or plastics. In 1907, Leo Bakerland invented Bakelite, and so with the first synthetic plastic began the resin revolution that pervades our world today. Now, the original Bakelite is a heat molded uh, phenol formaldehyde. It's limited to dark colors. From 1930, it became the major material for radio cabinets. In 1925, uh, urea formaldehyde was invented in the UK. It's also molded, but it can be produced in many colors. And after 1933 became popular in the USA and Australia, uh, not so much in England, funnily enough. Um, and the term Bakelite is generally used to cover all these, all these molded resins uh, on that you can see at the moment. In 1927, Catalan was invented in the USA, and it's a slightly different, it's a phenol formaldehyde, but it's a cast without fillers uh, and is translucent. And from 1936, beautiful colored Catalan radios were made only in the USA in every color imaginable, but they were more expensive because they needed hand finishing and were subject to fracture. All these new plastics were significant for radio because they allowed the designers to create cheap mass produced cabinets, which reflected the new machine age styling. And while you'll see many pictures of colored radios, it's striking that only two countries embraced colored radios in the 30s and 40s, Australia and the US. UK and Europe had only wood and brown Bakelite till the 1950s when color became more popular. And it's interesting, if you look at the Australia, I mean, you look at the American colors and they are just absolutely uh, wonderful, um, all sorts of colors, quite clearly uh, 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 reflecting any color that the, that the uh, uh, 
company decided they wanted to use. But in Australia, you can see if you ignore this one in the middle, which was a one-off, they are all um, designed to mimic in plastic more expensive materials. Ebony, ivory, jade, marble, and walnut. And while the Air Kings are unashamedly vibrant shades, I think AWA was still unsure about the public perception of plastic and hedged their bets in terms of the colours that they used. Now, I'm coming back to the small plastic radio in terms of price. We said that the column air was about 193. And if you look here, you've got an $85 console radio and $139 console radio in the early to mid 30s, at least $100. And if we look at how the market could be approached with a small radio, all having the same general design, but offered in a number of variations, we see it clearly here with the John Bassos design RCA Victor Little Nipper, because it was produced in a number of different materials um, at different price points. The cheapest one was the Bakelite in, at $9.95. The Plascon, which is urea formaldehyde, uh, at $12.95. The wood radio was $14.95, and your Catalan was $17.95. But compared to the $100 or $130 for a wood console, these are extraordinarily cheap. Now, yes, there are millions of really, really cheap dark brown radios, which are not particularly exciting. But there are also many that show the influence of the designers and stand above the pack. And you can see some of these here from the USA, UK, Czechoslovakia, Australia, and Germany. And with the urea formaldehydes, um, immediately you move from one model with one version. And suddenly, color meant multiple versions for each model and color choices for the consumer. This one came up at auction. It was a one-off color uh, nicknamed uh, in Australia. This is called a Vomitron. Uh, my wife said, no way. Uh, I, I was really tempted, but I resisted. And it, it went for about $20,000, that radio. Now, these ones Jan didn't mind because she liked the colors of these, but the mulberry and blue tones are really intense and they're offset by the different color handles, knobs and feet. We'll come to that in a minute. The Catalan radios are just eye candy. They're all the colors of the rainbow. And note the mix and match of colors, the cabinet one color and the bezel handle and knobs another. It's just a simple idea, but it created an enormous range of offerings from the same model. And I think this is the first time mix and match was done. It's common today, but this is where it started. It's simple, but it's very clever. It would be unfair to presume that all wood radios missed the deco makeover. And you can see here, these Australian and American radios show some lovely deco touches. I like this one. This is an Italian radio, uh, the Ducati, shaped like a bread basket. And this was the same Ducati company that makes motorcycles, but they didn't make their first motorcycle till 1949. And in 1940, they were making radios. In the late 40s, large department stores like Sears in the States sold cheap chrome radios, which are in the two top rows here. And today they're both beautiful, collectible and symbolic of the machine age and mass production. And actually when you combined wood and chrome highlights, it made a huge difference to the appeal of the wood radio. Some of the, some of the people like um, uh, Dorwin Teague, uh, used mirrored glass with chrome accents, and they were avant-garde, still seem futuristic today. And a few were made with glass and metal, and a couple, uh, this Vassos-designed radiogram was made in aluminium. The mirrored glass Spartan Nocturne and Bluebird from Dorwin Teague still have that sense of coming from the future, and they are probably the most exquisite radios I think ever designed. The four foot diameter nocturne was probably designed for a major Hollywood house or a hotel foyer. There are probably only 10 or 20 left today. Most are in museums and a few in major collections. I think I have the only one outside the USA. It is the most valuable of all the Art Deco radios with a price now well in excess of $100,000. After the war, there were new plastics such as Lucite and acrylic and uh, 
they were the sort of plastics that you tended to see in the 50s in, in America, Australia and the UK before transistors changed radio forever. There was also paint that could be, uh, you could paint over Bakelite metal and wood, and that was uh, quite commonly done. I like to show these three radios because they show the stylistic range of radio in the early to mid thirties in three different examples. On the left is the Belgian Rubus in wood showing its European roots and its sinuous nouveau heritage a cross between Gaudi and Alva Alto, sticking with wood, looking forward to Deco while still a foot in the past. The Echo by Wells Coates is elemental and restrained, the best of mass, mass production with Bakelite, a little hint of Bauhaus, of arts and craft, but clearly moving to a new future. And note the conformity of vertical lines in the radio and the stand. And the Spartan, this is the US designers at their best, exuberant, unrestrained, innovative. The new streamlined style of the 30s using chrome and mirrored glass, shedding history, saying goodbye to the past. I don't think there were a lot of these radios that I've shown you in India. Um, India was part of the British Empire in the 30s and 40s. Most radios were imported from England, as you can see here, Philips, Echo, uh, Eddie Stone, Mullard, all came from England. But actually, I was surprised that a number came from uh, the USA, uh, DeWald Airline, uh, a few consoles, uh, mainly wood, of course, uh, and, and a few Bakelite radios. The Echo Company in England, which is where Wells Coates did his designs and Serge Chemayev, um, they formed uh, the National Echo Radio and Engineering Company in Bombay, and that was manufacturing licenses, uh, uh, radios under license to Echo in the late 50s and 60s. And as you can see here, um, and uh, these radios were at uh, range between 250 rupees and 495 rupees. I couldn't find many colored radios in India. The top one's an Echo. Uh, they're both echoes. The top one looks like painted over Bakelite and the bottom one looks like uh, plastic. Um, I don't know whether they were imported or assembled in India. Um, in countries like USA and Australia, after the war, Art Deco styling faded and the radio really became just a commonplace appliance. And the 50s could be called the atomic age with really cheap plastics, every choice of colour and a more replaceable feel to the radio. Some of these became the third and fourth radios in the house as there was much more disposal income in Western households. And the 1960s heralded the transistor age with miniaturization, standardization, sort of like our phones today, all much the same shape and design with minimal external differences. Now, of course, the story of radio is not just about the cabinet, but it served as the magic reservoir for radio programs, which once you got past the warming up, the static and the tuning, were involving, entertaining, compelling, even inspiring. And in the 1930s, um, many of the shows, comedy shows, were compulsory listening for audiences with something like on one night, uh, 40 million people might listen to an episode of Amos and Andy. But radio was not always benign. Uh, Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and Lenin in the Soviet Union used government ownership to make radio an efficient propaganda tool starting around 1932-33. By 1934, all radio manufacturers in Germany had to devote at least 40% of production to people's radios, such as the Volksempfänger, which you can see on the right here, uh, designed by Walter Maria Kirsting, which only broadcast Nazi radio stations. The two Italian radios you can see here, you can see Mussolini's axe in the grill work. I think India was a bit more benign, but as I said before, the private radios were considered a threat to the government. Now, that brings up another innovation that came with the new plastic radios, design independent of function. The incorporation of shapes, imagery and motifs into the cabinet design, which reflected everything from scenery to speed, something that didn't happen much, if at all, with traditional wood consoles or even 
wood tabletops. The embedding of electronics into products resulted in the most radical shift in both design possibilities and people's relationship with objects. Actually, for the first time, the potential behavior and functionality of a product was disconnected from its physical form. If you look at this Australian World Net Radio of 1937, it has the three completely different representations. The external cabinet is in the architectural form of the skyscraper. The speaker grill is overlaid by a Bakelite pastoral Australian scene with sunrise. And on the dial, when it's on, shows the world and electricity. This may have been a multifaceted marketing strategy or just a radio designed by a committee. And just out of interest, there are only three known examples of this radio left, two black, one brown. There are a few instances of indigenous cultural motifs being expressed in radio design. The Air King 54 with his Egyptian style insert reflects the fascination of the public with newly found earlier cultures. Most extraordinary are these two examples of EGM radios, which was Electra General Motors in Mexico with clear Aztec designs in the grill. This Canadian Addison radio um, very much looks to me like a Mayan temple. In Australia, we produced this radio, uh, the radio let, which is called the fret and foot. It has this solid buttressing intricate fret fretwork and feet clearly resembling lion's paws and uh, clearly looks a little like the Sphinx. Now, some radios clearly derive from other streamlined deco objects, skyscrapers, which you can see on the left, trains and rockets on the right, uh, bullets such as the Syarts and the Fader bullet and the Czechoslovakian talisman, Tesla talisman. Uh, the Spartan sled uh, looks like a sled. Um, the grill of a car. You can see here from three European countries and, and, and America, um, different ways in which this was represented. The Bang & Olufsen here uh, has a, a clear Scandinavian flourish. It was one of their first Bakelite radios called a beer lit, and they still call their speakers beer lit today. Now, to some purists, these are just decorative embellishments. We have to recognise the innovative use of new materials, new shapes, new colours, and a design heritage that pushed the radio beyond its core function to become a beautiful object in the home or workplace. A good example of this is Raymond Lowy's uh, uh, Colonial Globe radio. Now, this was ignored by collectors for many years because they thought of it as a, an oldie item and completely missing the extraordinary technical and design innovations of this early plastic radio by the great Raymond Lowy, who was trying to show radio uh, was a world uh, feature that the communication was going right around the world. And if you look at the equator ring, the knob on the left is the volume on and off and the knob on the right changes the station. Um, the globe icon was also used as a decal, like a sticker uh, in the dial as an insert and over the speaker. Uh, the Spartan Bluebird you see here um, uh, appears to have been designed uh, in the uh, shape of a triplane and uh, the Britain and Lumifon uh, clearly resemble uh, a theatre and stage uh, in, in the way they're presented. Flying saucers were big in the 40s and uh, uh, you can see here uh, a couple of radios that reflect, or even earlier than the 40s, uh, reflect a, a, a view uh, of the modernity or the ultra modernity of a flying saucer, that imagery. Interesting ones such as waterfalls in these two American radios and in this French radio, uh, the shape of a butterfly. The sun's rays, lots of radios showed the sun's rays as it lent itself to deco lines and angulations. Um, and you can see it all here. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Pi portable here from England in 1948, Pi had had this um, logo uh, since the uh, 20s or since the 30s, um, but they uh, s sort of made it more deco in this particular radio. And as soon as it came out, the public hated it because they reckoned it looked like uh, the, uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, the Japanese uh, 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 sign. And in fact, they pulped the whole uh, 
uh, run of radios. All those radios were destroyed. The only radios that exist were the ones that were actually sold, and that only happened for a few weeks. So very rare radio uh, that uh, 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 Pi uh, was forced to, uh, to uh, destroy. There's flowers, um, and you will see, you saw in the Son and Bloom, uh, the flower here, uh, the little mini Lux speaker. And of course, most of it's simple and beautiful in these three. Uh, in this uh, rare Belgian uh, radio, the flowers have gone wild. Rural scenes don't come up very often, and particularly in the plastic. Uh, this Genelex, it's in the actual grill cloth. Uh, here in this, uh, uh, Beal radio. It's actually in wood and uh, the Phillips made a very nice symbolic sky and stars uh, with a contrasting speaker cloth behind. There are some interesting radios. This was this was a, a, a shelf of books um, and this was made in Chile for the US market. Uh, one of the prettiest radios from General Electric's, the only one they ever made in Catalan, um, comes in a beautiful translucent marbleized reddish tortoise shell color, looks like a jewelry box. And when you open it up, you reveal the radio dials and the speaker grill in between. Rarely was there any semblance of mimicking the human form. Although when we look at Noguchi's design for a remote speaker relaying sounds from a child's room, we can see clearly that it looks like a nurse uh, the headdress uh, and face of a nurse. Maybe more uh, unintentional is Jesse Collins' Echo Radio um, from 1936, which is most appealing because it has a sort of benign robotic face. And at over 21 inches tall, it's probably the largest single piece Bakelite moulding ever made. Uh, Stuart Warner uh, got away with uh, a flapper cutout in the metal cabinet. Uh, very simple, very clever. And I'm chasing these two radios. So if anybody knows where they are, uh, and uh, please let me know. Um, the mini Lux speakers you saw before um, have two versions of the flapper with slightly different hand painted features in the celluloid. Um, this elegant German Siemens radio cabinet was nicknamed gentleman in a tuxedo, probably not originally intended in the design. And few radios are considered sexy but the other outrageous Count Alexis Sarknovsky produced this for Emerson in 1938, and the shape seems to have clear human counterparts. It was, uh, it was quickly nicknamed May West, and the truth is actually stranger than fiction. Um, uh, Sarknovsky knew May West, um, and this is her in action in the film Going to Town, and the radio truly duplicates her costume and special attributes. According to her secretary, Mae West enjoyed the attribution and had one of these radios in her private study. Sometimes these are novelty radios, but these are very well made uh, Ameri using famous American characters on uh, into the recess of the front of the cabinet. And this company, Majestic, they clearly targeted a discreet market in the younger generation with uh, an attractive and engaging facade that added a visual element to the basic acoustic medium of the radio. Um, sometimes the escutcheons, which house the dial and knobs and can be a metal plastic, uh, contain wonderful deco details and the scarab holding the uh, magic eye at the bottom is, is really unique and uh, links to the past, whereas the beautiful circles and lines of the Spartan in the centre look to the future. As I mentioned before, the Catalan radios started this mix and match uh, idea in 1936. Um, the butterscotch colour here was originally white, but it oxidises to uh, this butterscotch color over time. And you see here with the fader radios, this one on the right has been polished back to its original color, but over a couple of years, it will change back to this butterscotch. Here, by using and swapping and mixing and matching, they increased the number of models available for each particular line. And so there were um, quite different looking radios with very similar colors. Probably the most elegant radio ever made um, small radio is the Teague's uh, tiny Clozon radio, Clozonet radio, four colours with a combination of a Catalan cabinet, uh, urea formaldehyde knobs, a metallic Clozonet front trimmed with a lattice work of chrome elements using circles and lines. I used it for the cover of my book because it represents the best of deco radio design. They're now selling 
uh, for approximately ten to twenty thousand dollars each. One of the best and smartest designs was Bill Getty's wartime Patriot, which channeled the American flag in three mix and match color versions using blue, red, and white combinations. Patriotic radios do appear. This was the nineteen. 52 Red Star uh, uh, in Russia, uh, which is uh, uh, based on a French radio. I thought it was interesting that from an Art Deco point of view, parallel lines are a standard feature of the style and one of the hallmarks of streamlining. And in my collection of three, 320 radios, I could only find 10 radios that didn't have parallel lines in the design. And I should mention that although I'm not a fan of wooden consoles, there are some gems like this Radio Alva from France with its elegant vertical lines and tapering shape. And the most beautiful uh, wooden console is this uh, New Zealand uh, Pacific Elite um, uh, of which there's probably three or four left uh, that we know of. So this picture tends to help us realize how radio changed the world. Um, it was a new form of mass communication, but the industrial designers change things. And if you look at radio as just a communication device and focus on the tubes or content, you miss that subtle but fundamental change that occurred in 1930 with the advent of the tabletop radio and the incorporation of streamlined design. The conception is Europe, the birth is America, but the development and maturation is worldwide. The impact of these industrial designers so early in their careers is significant barely mentioned, much less appreciated. Their ability to use new materials, create new designs for a radio cabinet, which was, uh, sorry, which was portable, affordable and marketable in difficult, difficult times was momentous. So these designers helped change radio from a novelty to a necessity. The integrated tabletop radio took radio out of the lounge into all rooms of the house and into the workplace. They used synthetic materials rather than traditional organic materials. The artisans with wood were replaced by mass production and an assembly line and the radio became more affordable. With more than one set in the house, there were many more listeners for a wider variety of programs and with news and entertainment, the home became part of the outside world. The variety of cabinet shapes and colors of the radio made it not just a piece of furniture, but a stylish domestic appliance. The designs of the industrial designers were innovative, inspired, not extensions of traditional Victorian and Gothic styles. And the introduction of color made the radio animated with many choices for the consumer and able to be made part of room decor. In India, like the rest of the world, there are radio collectors and those who love to repair old radios. From these pictures, we can get a sense of what was available in India in the period from the 30s onwards and a few of the collectors. You may wonder at the value of some of these radios. It's just coincidentally an auction is coming up on the 25th of March in California. This radio is being estimated somewhere between 15 and 25,000. And I would think it could reach anywhere up to $50,000, except that it has um, a very faded inset and the knobs may not be original. So people ask me, which is my favorite radio? And truthfully, every day is different. They speak to me in diverse ways. In my shallowest moments, it's the most valuable, but more often I'll look around and each one I've chosen to own resonates with the special attributes in design, presentation, color, and history, which I still find attractive and satisfying. So the breadth and depth of dissemination of these radios speaks to the global nature of Art Deco. It adds to the contention that these radios represent a cogent, comprehensive, and international illustration of the style, as well as the work and influence of the world's great industrial designers. This is the thesis of my book, Deco Radio. And while this international collection may never be on public display, at least in the book, through the photography, the radios are immortalized together. And as radio morphs into being just another segment of the digital media world we have available to us, it is important we recognize its unique history and preserve the evidence of its glorious beginnings. So I'm happy to receive questions through my email, which is on the screen. Um, and please excuse the, uh, the shameless plug, but if anybody's interested in purchasing books, please contact me. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this brief foray into another aspect of the wonderful world of Art Deco, in this case, through the unusual filter of the story of radio design. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, that was 
an absolutely astounding presentation and has brought so many interesting connections to mind, uh, many of which you have, uh, in fact, established yourself uh, through the course of this, uh, this presentation. And uh, I cannot tell you how grateful I am uh, for contextualizing uh, the location of the radio in the larger uh, picture of design in the early 20th century. Uh, the examples you showed were fabulous, and uh, we are very envious of you as a collector. Uh, the, what, what strikes me uh, particularly is how smoothly the design of the radio fits in with the larger trends of design during the 30s and 40s, uh, and at different scales, you know, whether it is at the, a very small scale of jewelry design or the scale of the skyscraper itself, uh, the radio fits into that overall language uh, of, of design in a very, very smooth kind of way. So to look at it as uh, part of, an, uh, of the larger enterprise of Art Deco is not at all difficult uh, when we look at the different radios. And the other very significant thing is the break from the past. You have shown it also as a technological uh, idea, the break from the past uh, in terms of the way uh, the, the radio kind of became a different uh, entity from that of the earlier uh, radiogram or the record player. But uh, architecture too during this time uh, of Art Deco was a break from the past uh, and really had, uh, had nothing to uh, uh, have uh, in common with the, the revivalist uh, movements of the turn of the century. Uh, we also see that in, in other designs and of course the presence of the industrial designers as you have very clearly demonstrated uh, becomes a very important uh, part of that. I think the, the, the little summary which you did in the end uh, talked not only about radios but probably talked about all types of design that came up during the 1930s and 40s. So thank you very much for that. It was uh, a beautiful uh, presentation in context, as well as a continuous delight to look at the different uh, objects that uh, you showed us. Thank you very much. I I liked, I think they're beautiful. And uh, and regardless of, of, of all the, the background, um, I think they're a pleasure to see. And that in itself, um, you can have an emotional enjoyment with radios that is completely divorced from all the, the theory and, 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 uh, uh, and contextualization that we're going through. Um, and so uh, that's one of the things that appeals to me. And it's interesting that most of the people who collect radios um, uh, aren't interested in the background. They're not interested in this timeline. They're not interested in the style. They're interested in simply the fact that they like what they, I mean, if you ignore the guys who are just uh, repairing radios and, and, and do it for that reason. But th those sort of, uh, uh, the people who like the, the Art Deco radios uh, have a different uh, view. They, they are appreciating the front of the radio. Uh, they may enjoy the back as well, but, the, but they, they like the front. And you very interestingly even showed us how the back was a uh, part of the industrial design process. So well, it, it made a difference just because a if you together thing. Well, the, with a with a wooden radio, you had to leave a lot of space because the heat could heat. set off, it could burn. And so, with the particularly once Bakelite came out and it was non-flammable, um, they could get that very close to the valves. Um, I didn't show any pictures, but Catalan was a problem if you left the radio on for too long, you could get a burn mark on okay. through the Catalan, but it didn't happen with Bakelite. Bakelite was resistant to that. I have a couple of uh, questions, uh, and that is that the, the tabletop radios which you showed us, Bakelite, Catalan, the other materials, uh, at that time, how were they powered? The radios? That's right. Almost invariably, uh, either AC or battery. 
So a so number... batteries had come in uh, at that time. Batteries uh, were there before. The, the batteries, I, which we mean the, the cells. Yeah, but they would... Norm, some of them, the cell was inside the... that They designed the radio with a battery inside it. And so for rural purposes, in Australia particularly, a lot of radios, the larger tabletops, were able to be made with a battery cell um, that could be... Uh, or an external battery, and they were mainly for rural use. I, I ask this because of the notion of portability. You know, uh, at what point uh, would you say that you could take the radio, lie on your bed, and put it on your belly and listen to the music? That would be. Un that's not the way it happened. Uh, it would be the fifties. Oh yeah. Okay. Not, not the, no. in the late 40s, they started to produce some, in Australia anyway, a portable radios, which could be, bat were battery operated um, and they could be carried around. Um, but I would think that it wasn't till the mid 50s. Um, uh, in, in, when I was a child, which was uh, in, in, in Australia in 1950, you, if you had a radio, it was at the head of your bed. And it was attached to the electrical outlet. And right. you, at night when everybody had gone to bed, you would play with the radio. And because uh, a lot of the local stations had, had uh, turned off, you could often get stations uh, much further remote. Um, and if, with shortwave, you could sometimes get overseas radios. But from Australia, that was not that easy. And when did the transition happen from... Uh, to, to what we now call transistor radios, because 60. that really reduced the size of the radio even further. 57, I think, was the first, or 54 right. and to 57 were the first transistors, transistor radios, and by about 1960, um, that was the, that was making the big change. So uh, I've got a, I've got one of Sony's first transistor radios, which is, is about the same size as my portable radios because um, at first they were quite large, um, but it, very quickly they miniaturized them. And uh, by, by, the, by the early 70s, they were really miniaturized. You know, they were yeah. the size of what we now look at as early mobile phones. Absolutely. You know, with the aerial that kind of came out of that. And, and what's fascinating is that the transistor radio tended to be very much like the mobile phone of today in terms of they're all look exactly the same. And then you put something over the top of them. Like in those days, it was a leather case. Uh, yes. These days it's a little plastic, plastic. Yeah, thing I remember the leather case. Yes. That's the leather right. cases to make them safer or more pretty or whatever else it was. And it's sort of so completely different from what we were seeing with these radios from the thirties, where it was, it was all about what the radio looked like um, and miniaturization has perhaps taken away some of the stylistic possibilities yeah. uh, for it, it looks much more industrial the smaller it gets yeah but the 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 leather i think case was because it also had a shoulder strap you know and those you, things too yeah and it's yeah, a bit like cameras it, too cameras too you buy a leather leather thing to cover it with um yeah. but i I, I think these radios of that period just represent um, a singular, it's like a singularity. It's like something actually happened and before there was nothing and afterwards there was nothing. But mm. at that time, there was this, this wonderful moment. And I think it's so important that we at least formalise it and make sure we understand it um, and, and crystallise it. Uh, so that it's not lost completely because radio, uh, my, my grandchildren won't understand. I mean, my grandchildren don't understand how you, what you do with the radio. Mm -hmm. they, they, they actually look at it as some sort of odd object. And it's a bit like um, I, I saw something recently where some kids couldn't work out how to dial a telephone mm -hmm. yes. because they didn't understand you put your finger in and turn it around. They didn't get that. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, radio also makes two connects when it comes to the evolution of the technology. In the early days, you have the radiogram, which is a combination of the gramophone uh, player and the radio. And by the 70s, you have what in India we used to popularly call a two-in-one, which was a radio and a cassette player. Right. 
and uh, yeah. of course Panasonic and all that. The Japanese companies came in a big way uh, in the in the late 70s, uh, and well, that can... kind of transition and radio kind of you know makes the connect between the two. It does. It, it's interesting to watch that to, to see that linear thing of the radio, the radio and the radiogram that continued on from basically the late twenties to virtually the sixties. Um, and then suddenly it disappeared. Um, yeah. and, uh, now of course, everything's modular or totally integrated. So, uh, the, it's a different world now and the technology has made it, uh, such that, um, the, the, independence of these things is actually not a benefit it's it, it True. they're all now everything is integrated in one it's all yeah. integrated and yeah. and we have to accept that that's that's now the internet the the radio is part of the internet um yeah. uh, it's it's not that same world anymore uh you know the telephone the radio all of the the television uh they're all one one singularity now another question i had was on the nature of bakelite because uh, you mentioned that it it was particularly useful because it was non-flammable, but then bakelite also was used for a variety of other things, not only the making of radios. Oh, absolutely! Before it was used for radio, it took it was it was invented in 1907, and for the next 10 or 15 years, I mean, Ray, uh, the uh, Leo Beekeland was on the front of Time magazine. Uh, and it would said this is the material of a thousand uses, and he was wrong. He said a thousand; it was a hundred thousand uses. Mm. And what they used it for a lot in the early days were light switches, light covers, uh, all sorts of small <clears throat> little things where uh, uh, ele electrical technology might be involved, and that that incorporated that um, uh, non-flammable nature. Uh, and boxes and all sorts of things. So a lot of small things were produced in Bakelite. And it wasn't till the 30s that they managed to produce large uh, presses, which were something like 40 or 50 feet high, which would produce enough pressure to create a cabinet. Um, so it took a while. But uh, I mean, apparently in the atomic bomb, there was Bakelite. Okay. There, there's a piece of Bakelite that had something to do with the way the atomic bomb was made. And I assume it's non flammability uh, was very useful, um, uh, but it was there. And coming back to the uh, art deco, especially the, the kind of depictions which you showed in the form of motifs and uh, symbols and so on. Uh, I find it amazing that uh, those are so ubiquitous because we find them in a lot of the building facades in Bombay. You know, the parallel lines, the streamlining, the stepped facades, the sunbursts, the waves, surf, uh, even some scenes or some figurative uh, depictions. Uh, it's almost like the radio is a scaled down building. And you did mention I, that. I think that's right. And I, and I mean, when you think about it, right, uh, uh, Harold Van Doren's um, Air King of 1933 was basically number one, the first thing that was done. And I think that everybody looked at that and thought, oh, my God, we have to follow this sort of style. And so you see this buttressing and shoulders. And, of course, the ability of Bakelite to be polished with an edge, mm -hmm. made with an edge, whereas in wood that would be very difficult to have a stepped or buttressed arrangement. In yeah. Bakelite it was easy. So suddenly you got this whole, uh, uh, the parallel lines and the stepping and so forth, which was reminiscent of uh, a, an architectural uh, object. But because of casting, you would never get a sharp corner. Wouldn't that be correct? It would always be a little rounded. Now you can uh, get or quite... streamline to use the language of deco. Look, you can get you can get quite quite sharp edges. Okay. They most of them were slightly rounded, and that just made, meant easier cleaning. Um, but no, there are some with very very solid little uh, step step arrangements um, uh, in 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 the in the molding. Um, it was very 
I mean, they got to the point where they could produce virtually anything that you design it, and then then the then the the press just beats it out. And uh, uh, a lot of the bakelite required, and that's they could employ um, uh, much cheaper labour uh, to clean the bakelite um, cases than 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 it cost in in a furniture uh, factory to sure. uh, polish and and sand the the wood. Uh, Atul, uh, would uh, you like to uh, kind of take a few questions if there are some? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. That was absolutely exceptional. Uh, so enjoyable, so refreshing. We uh, have spent so much time researching Deco and so many aspects of it, but this opens up a whole different conversation and research area for us. Uh, and uh, we have... Uh, Lots of questions. Let me give you the first one. Um, I'll give you an easy one, Peter. Which was the most recent addition to your collection and why is it special? Uh, the most recent addition. Um, I bought a Catalan radio about six months ago. Um, it was a different color to the one I had. And uh, so uh, half the problem is that you can't just buy one because then there's another color uh, and it becomes this obsession to have all the colors. Um, so I'm always tempted by a new color um, uh, sometimes. And, and that becomes, that becomes a sort of pyramid um, with the rarer colors becoming more and more expensive and more difficult to get. <coughs> so but I, I, I have a kind of subsidiary question to this, that every time you buy a new radio, what is it that you can actually hear on it today in terms of the broadcast stations? Any AM, any uh, uh, medium wave radio station. AMs are still available, uh, stations not broadcast for, in AM. Yeah, but not for long here. We're losing AM in the next few years. So right. um, that's going to be an issue for these radios and... Uh, uh, so there are a number of people uh, offering to upgrade them sort of to a Bluetooth. Uh, and is so it? <laughs> you can still use them. Is, is shortwave available? Shortwave is, but it depends on the radio. Uh, a number of radios only have uh, an AM band. Uh, 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 most of the American radios have two bands. Uh, Australian radios, a, mix, a mixed batch. I mean, some of them are just just a local local radio stations, and that's all you can get. So, on the question of color, Peter, we have a question from Nitya who asks uh, that were the manufacturers aware <laughs> that material color would change, and uh, from white to butterscotch, as you showed us. No, they had no idea. Um, okay. And the part two to that question is that could you talk about the economic value? of the radio, did that also change or, uh, and how did it change? Okay, color first. Um, there are no, U, it's, it's a UV problem, uh, ultraviolet light, and there are no inhibitors in the Catalan. So the uh, light affects it. Um, people have been trying to work out some way of stopping that change from occurring, putting a lacquer over it, all sorts of things. It makes no difference at all. Uh, you can polish it up and that means removing uh, a, a layer. small layer of the uh, Catalan um, and um, but it doesn't last uh, a year or two down the track you'll start to see the the the, the color uh, changing to butterscotch luckily the butterscotch color is really quite pretty in its own right um, interestingly the greens tend to change to a darky muddy blue um, so often you'll see a radio that looks like a brownie blue and it turns out to be bright green. Um, so there's th these changes do occur, um, uh, but mainly, mainly with the, the, the white ones. Um, the economic value, uh, what sort of, what, what did you mean? The, the, do they think, change in I value? Think the question was due to oxidization, is there also a change in the economic value? No, 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 no. Um, most people accept that that's a, um, a patina that's part of the part of the 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 proof that it's an original Catalan uh, that it has changed color so no that wouldn't stop you buying it although some people uh, will immediately send the radio off to be polished uh, once they buy it but 
and I did that for a while, but then I've realized, you know, two years down the track, I've, I've, I'm in the same position again. And, and I don't really want people, you know, taking more and more of the radio off. We have a question from Professor Mary Woods. Uh, she says, ask, did other modernisms, that is Bauhaus or international styles, affect radio design apart from Noguchi, or did Art Deco completely dominate it? And if did if Art Deco did dominate, then why? What accounted for this? It's a good question. I I I think the impetus of those designers in the 30s and the fact that there were so many of them all doing the same thing at much the same time it it became it became sort of like a a, a wave of of that was the way that that if you were going to design it you would use the these styles um art nouveau doesn't work with 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 radio design it's just too too fussy and too difficult to reproduce um uh Bauhaus, I, I think, is part of what we is simplified deco. So you could probably see some radios with a very simple design and say that was uh, uh, had a Bauhaus a Bauhaus sense to it. Um, but it appears that other than if you ignore these styles, what you had were Victorian Gothic. Uh, um, a whole Edwardian styles, which were maintained right throughout the 30s and 40s, particularly with the wooden radios, um, and even even with the Bakelite radios, some of them were very bland, um, uh, with minimal styling or uh, a, a nod to one or the other, uh, you know, a nod to to deco or a nod to to the Gothic styling. But the uh, shape, it was the shape change to the square radio that sort of eliminated much of that Victorian and Gothic styling. Um, but I don't, I, for whatever reason, I don't think any anything else got a look in in that 20 year period. That 30s but and 40s was all Peter, about- What happens, uh, sorry, uh, Peter, what happens in the 50s and 60s? Because by then deco kind of goes into a bit of a decline and you have a much more modernist kind of sensibility in the other like in architecture, for example. So in the yes. design of the radios, uh, is there a transition in the- Yes, there is. It's that mid-century modern type look. It's that atomic, yes. I show the picture with the atomic age and they they look different. They're squarer, they're less, uh, less stylized. Um, radio became, and, and the, the, the newer plastics um, also were easier to produce. So, so the, the radios tended to lack the elegance of the, uh, the earlier radios, uh, but they themselves reflected that time. And so um, you, you had a lot of radios which were often quite long, uh, bread, bread basket shaped, um, uh, a lot that looked like uh, um, uh, sort of the Jetsons sort of effect. Uh, so that was the that was the fifties and sixties um, before the and just well mainly the fifties before the transistor came in. Um, so yes, there was a discrete change um, yeah. in in the fifties, and that ref, that also was part to do with the the cheaper plastics. Um, so Peter, we have a question: Are there any radio new radio designs uh, in the Art Deco format? This is a question from Adil. I think if you look at some of the Scandinavian radios, uh, Bang & Olufsen, uh, Bose, some of those people, um, uh, I think you'll see that transition from uh, the, the simplified Art Deco to a very much more modern style. And I, so I think, I, I think if you look at Scandinavia, you can see the transition uh, uh, th that went from Art Deco to modernism. And I think the Scandinavians show it very well. And particularly in their radios. Yeah. Uh, Professor, we have another question. Uh, was the radio considered an instrument of modernity during the Deco era in India? 
or was it treated more as a functional instrument? Uh, I think it was very much part of the, uh, the, the a, a very trendy kind of thing, even during the deco era. Uh, but I think like Peter showed us, the early manifestations were probably these large wooden cabinets, which were uh, called radiograms and things like that, but which were uh, done in uh, very much art deco kind of styling. And they fit in with the larger interior objects of the age, uh, such as sofa sets and uh, dressing tables and, uh, I suppose, dining uh, tables and so on. So it is definitely an aspect of interior design uh, in, the, in the early 30s. And you have these uh, uh, quite large uh, mantel, not, not exactly mantelpiece things, but more of... Uh, a kind of you know side table kind of size uh, of of radios, uh, sometimes integrated with the gramophone, uh, uh, with the record players in them. So yes, I would say that they were part of uh, the the styling at that time. And I think radio would always have been trendy because that was the one means by which you got uh, popular culture straight into your household. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but we'll do two quick questions. Uh, Peter, do you think that the radio will make a comeback now that uh, there are new platforms like Club, Clubhouse and Podcasts where the spoken word is re-emerging on various digital media? Yes, I, I, I think radio will retain um, its position. I, uh, I mean, I think the video or television and that has has enormous influence and and the use of a phone allows you to almost you know have somebody visually being seen and spoke and speaking in your hand but i still think people are going to be driving and people are going to be ironing and people are going to be working and i think there's still going to be a place for the radio um if not for um drama and stuff like that but and and it's interesting though that audible uh, you know people are having books read to them uh, and yes. that's that's a sort of form of of radio um so i do think radio will continue albeit uh, it will be a it won't be the same radio as we understood but i think podcasts and things like that which now you can uh, it's not a passive system where you wait, where you only get it once at a particular time. You can now um, uh, have your uh, radio whenever you choose. And um, that's the big change that's taken place over the last few years is, is the ability to have things at your leisure. But I think radio um, has a place and, and an important place um, uh, in, in our culture. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Australia and India are great cricketing nations. Uh, there's a question. Do fans in Australia also carry transistor radios to cricket matches? I, I don't think they do anymore, but there was a period where people would go to the, to the cricket and listen to the ABC, which was the uh, uh, broadcasting, the, the, the government, radio which had the best commentators and so they would they would watch the cricket and listen to the commentators uh, on their radio and that was a very very common thing for many many years um i think that's probably not as common as it used to be um but uh uh today um it's uh i think there's so much entertainment uh at a cricket match uh that uh it's unlikely you would be spending much time on your radio Thank you so much, both of you, Professor, Peter. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. What an insight. And I think, you know, for me, it's, it's, I've, I've gone back in time to the early 20s and discovered, thanks to your presentation, that we had designers who made Maytag, Arco lamps, Ducati, and, you know, Mr. Lowy uh, made their advent really with the radio. And... Uh, their, their larger and much more famous works came later in their lives, uh, in the 30s onwards. 
And uh, I think that that takes Deco back by almost a decade in terms of you know the sweet spot in terms of when it started. Uh, of course, it is an amalgamation of several styles, and we have the Paris exhibition in 1925 as a benchmark. But you you've taken it one step even prior to that, and I think that was most interesting. And we look forward to engaging with you. Well, I'd like to thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it it's been an absolute pleasure, and and it's always exciting to to talk uh, to an audience that. Uh, has a different perspective and 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 can add something to this world picture. Mm -hmm.